Thanks, Nathan. And let's read together. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink, or in the matter of a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold onto the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are of no value in curbing self-indulgence. This is God's word. Thanks, Hano, and thanks, music team. Well, good evening, friends. It's always good to see all of us here for the evening service. Um, wonderful singing, by the way. It was really beautiful. And what a great saviour we are singing unto. Why don't we just go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you, Lord God, even for your goodness, your grace, your faithfulness toward us in our lives. Thank you for this opportunity to come together, Lord, this evening to sing songs of worship and adoration unto you and to even be able to open up your word to learn from your word tonight. We ask and pray that you have your way in our hearts, O God. Let our hearts be changed, transformed, and renewed by your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, have you, I wonder whether have you ever owned, or maybe should I, maybe, let me rephrase it, have you ever been duped all right, by counterfeits of any kind? Right, maybe what you once thought was a bargain actually turned out to be a dart. For example, oops, not working. <laughs> was meant to be some transition. Anyway, what you once thought was Adidas turned out to be Aribas. <laughs> or what you, turned, what you thought was Puma turned out to be Pumba, Lion King. <laughs> now, mind you, right, these are examples of, of obvious counterfeits. But there are counterfeits out there that are, they look exactly like the real thing. And friends, the thing is this. Count, such counterfeits are prevalent, they are pervasive, they are everywhere. Right, listen to how dictionary.com defines counterfeit. Right, it defines counterfeit as an imitation intended to be passed off fraudulently or deceptively as genuine. Right, in other words, counterfeits are things that present themselves to be the genuine article but are not. In fact, they are intended to deceive. Right, that's what counterfeits do. They deceive. And speaking of deception, we all know who the master deceiver is. We all know who the father of lies is. Mr. S.A. Tan, right? Satan. I like how Warren Willis B. describes Satan. He says, Satan is the counterfeiter. He has a false gospel preached by false ministers producing false Christians. Right? Satan plants his counterfeits wherever God plants true believers. Friends, these are sobering but true words. Words that we do well to pay attention to. Right? For Satan, he's after our downfall. He seeks to destroy us. He seeks to lead us astray. And he does that not by presenting us with blatant lies or obvious heresies, but by offering us a counterfeit version of the truth. By offering us something that resembles the truth, but is not the truth. Right? His goal is to, by any means possible, distract us from Christ and draw us away from Christ. And friends, the thing is this. It's one thing to be deceived by counterfeit products in the market today, humbling though they may be, but it's another thing, a much more serious and dire thing, to be deceived by Satan's counterfeits. And what's scary is that Satan, he specializes in cloaking his deceptions in the garb of what seems so right, so true, so Christian. And that, in a sense, was what, what, what was going on in the church at Colossae. As we've seen before, false teachers have crept into and were troubling the church, 
with a new kind of teaching. A teaching that is dangerous, not because it is outright heresy, but because it seems to be Christian when it is not. And the teaching does not deny Christ, but it adds to Christ. And in so doing, it demotes Christ, it detracts from Christ, and ultimately it draws people away from Christ. Simply put, it is a counterfeit Christianity promoted by false teachers, propelled by Satan. And Paul, having heard about what was going on in Colossae, he picked up his pen to write this letter to the Colossians, warning them about this false teaching, the so-called Colossian heresy that has crept into the church. Now, we mentioned the last time that no one knows for sure what the false teaching really is. But given the fact that Colossae was a cosmopolitan city with a wide variety of cultural and religious influences, you know, it's probable that the teaching was syncretistic in nature. That is, it is a teaching that had both Jewish and pagan elements thrown into the mix. And it's a teaching that seems to suggest that the Colossian believers' walk with Christ is somehow deficient and defective, that it is not full or complete. And friends, although we cannot nail down the precise nature of the Colossian heresy, right, Paul, in our passage today, provides us with a glimpse of some of its elements. For here, Paul deals head-on with the Colossian heresy. And the main point that Paul wants us to get as he tackles the various aspects of this heresy is this. Don't trade the genuine for the counterfeit. Right? Don't trade the genuine for the counterfeit. And what Paul does in our passage today is to highlight three counterfeit spiritualities promoted by the false teaching that he wants us to be aware of, namely the counterfeit spiritualities of legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. All right, so let's examine each of these in turn. Firstly, the counterfeit spirituality of legalism. Look at verse 16. Paul writes, Therefore, Right, therefore, that is in light of what Paul had written earlier in verses 9 to 15, as we saw last time, specifically that of our completeness in Christ, our fullness in Christ. What follows here in our passage today is simply the implications of that reality. And the first implication that Paul spells out is this. Verse 16, Paul says, Because you are complete in Christ, because you have everything you need in Christ, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Now, friends, we can't be too sure, and I don't think we need to get too hung up on this, but apparently the false teachers were imposing some kind of strict adherence to the Jewish law, specifically in the area of diet and days. Right? They were insisting that the Colossians keep certain Jewish dietary laws and observe certain Jewish festivals and days. Laws which, at the risk of oversimplification, was originally meant to demarcate God's people, to set God's people apart from the surrounding nations. We can read Leviticus 11 as an example. Now, we're not too sure, but maybe the false teachers, they viewed this as an indicator of piety or maybe as a means to spiritual maturity. And they were judging the Colossians on that basis. Right? They were saying, yes, it's great that you have received Christ, but if you really want to please God, if you really want to be spiritual, if you want to have fullness in Christ, then you must keep the Jewish dietary laws and observe the Jewish calendar. And this must, have sound, this, must, this must have sounded somewhat reasonable and even plausible to the Colossians. After all, these laws have their roots in the Old Testament. It's what God had required of his covenant people. But notice what Paul says. He says, no, right, don't let anyone judge you on such matters. Right? Paul is here warning the Colossians not to let anyone judge them. That is to deem them as unspiritual, unholy, or unqualified just because they do not observe these laws. In other words, they are not to allow the judgments of the false teachers to intimidate them, all right? to cause them to succumb to their demands. And what's Paul's reason for this? Well, verse 17, he says, These are a shadow of what was to come, the substance is Christ. Right, so what Paul is saying here is that to focus on these laws is to miss the point. Right, for these laws are not an end in and of themselves. They are a means to an end. Right, they are shadows. They are signposts. Right, they are meant to be a pointer. 
a pointer of what is to come, a pointer of the real thing, a pointer of the one who is the fulfillment of these laws, namely Christ. Right? He is the goal, the end, the telos of the law. Romans 10 verse 4. He is the substance, the reality to which these shadows pointed. Hebrews 10 verse 1. And now that Christ has come, we don't need to observe these laws anymore. Right? It makes no sense to go back to the shadow now that the reality has arrived. Let me just give you a silly example. All right. A few years ago, my wife, my dear wife, had to go to Texas for BSF training for about a week or so, about 10 days. And um, so I'm left home alone with my two kids. And my two kids missed her big time. All right, they cried almost every day. <laughs> I missed her too, but I didn't cry. <laughs> anyway, just imagine how absurd it would be all right, for me to, when she comes back home, to see her, hey, I've seen her, and I run up to her, and I throw myself on the ground, and I hug and kiss her shadow. I don't think my wife would be impressed by that. In fact, I think she would be worried. What has happened in the past week? <laughs> right? Or to use another analogy, this time from C.S. Lewis, it would be as absurd as making mud pies in the slum when we have a holiday at the sea. Right? It's absurd, it's ridiculous, it's ludicrous. But that's exactly what the false teachers were advocating. Right, they were telling the Colossians to go back to the law, to observe the rituals if they want to please God, if they want to be truly spiritual, if they want to have fullness in Christ, when all of these were already true of them in Christ. Now, friends, my guess is that none of us here were tempted to go back to the, observe the Old Testament dietary law, food laws or even the Jewish calendar. We all want our bacon from what I can see. Bacon, all right? It's good. But friends, that does not mean that this text has no relevance to us whatsoever. And for the truth is that there are Christians today who will not hesitate to impose extra-biblical rules and regulations on the consciences of other believers and then judge them for their failure to conform to those standards. We have a name for such ones. We call them legalists. And friends, whether we like it or not, my suspicion is that there is a legalistic tendency within each of us. Right, it seems hardwired in us, it seems ingrained in us, it seems natural to us. And there's a reason for this. It's because divine grace goes against the grain of our fallen human nature. We disdain it, we dislike it, and we always want to add something to the work of Christ. Right, listen to how Sam Storms perceptively diagnoses the human problem. He says, Wherever the gospel of grace is preached, Legalism rears its ugly head. Once you declare that God has graciously provided everything we need in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you can rest assured that fallen human nature will rise up in protest and try to sneak in somewhere a rule or regulation that we, in our own strength, can fulfill, or an observance or ritual that we, without God's enabling power, can perform that will enhance our spiritual standing or gain some reward that will put God in our debt. Friends, did you catch that? That's our natural inclination. And that, I believe, is one reason why we love man-made rules and regulations. Right? It's something that we can tick off and it makes us feel good about ourselves. Right? It appeals to our human nature, it appeals to our flesh, it appeals to our pride. But friends, it is here that we need to, we need to remember and heed Paul's counsel. We must not allow ourselves to be intimidated or by or succumb to the arbitrary judgments and artificial standards imposed upon us by others, things which God does not require of us. And neither must we impose such extra biblical standards upon others and judge them on that basis. So friends, with that in mind, let me just get us to do a quick heart check together to see whether, whether there's still any remnant of legalism within our hearts. Let's ask ourselves, friends, do we believe maybe sometimes even superstitiously, that our observance of certain rules or religious practices somehow earns us God's favour, even God's protection? Or do we feel pressured to conform to certain church customs or religious practices, thinking that we are unspiritual if we don't do so? Or maybe ask ourselves, you know, do we place a higher premium 
on our personal convictions than on biblical principles? Or do we elevate to the status of divine law, something that the Bible does not require, and then judge others on that basis? Now, friends, it's perfectly fine all right, for us to have personal convictions on things such as drinking, like what um, Hanu has said just now, or maybe even things like homeschooling. But friends, let's be careful not to impose these upon the consciences of other believers, especially when the Bible is silent on these matters. Friends, Paul's counsel is clear. Let's beware of the counterfeit, counterfeit spirituality of legalism. Let's not think that our observance of certain man-made rules somehow makes us right with God or improves our standing with Him. For doing so, we'll be, we'll be to exchange the real for the ritual, the genuine for the counterfeit. But friends, before we move on to the next point, let me just say this. Right, the antidote to the counterfeit spirituality of legalism as hinted by the therefore of verse 16, is none other than the gospel of Christ, of what God has done for us in Christ and who we now are in Him, complete and whole. Friends, remembering this and keeping this at the forefront of our minds will free us from the legalistic tendencies that is inherent in each of us. So friends, let's constantly remind ourselves and one another here at Grace Bible Church of the glorious gospel of our Lord, that because of His atoning death, and His glorious resurrection, we are now free and complete in Christ. All right, secondly, Paul warns us against the counterfeit spirituality of mysticism. Look at verse 18. He says, Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. All right, so what's happening here? Well, apparently the false teachers in Colossae Right, they, were, they were engaging in and promoting mystical practices and experiences. Practices and experiences that suggest that the Colossians were somehow missing out, that they were deficient, that they were second-rate, or if you like, second-class Christians. Right, the false teachers, we are told, were delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels and were claiming access to a visionary realm. My friends, this is a notoriously difficult verse. In fact, one scholar said that this, the interpretation of nearly every word or phrase in this verse has been disputed. For example, how should we best translate the term ascetic practices, which elsewhere appears simply as a positive trait of humility? Or the, um, the, the phrase worship of angels, how do we translate it? Is it worship directed towards angels? Is it worshipping with angels? Or is it simply invoking angels? Or how should we best translate the notoriously obscure phrase claiming access to a visionary realm? More literally rendered, entering into things, entering into what he has seen. My well, friends, it's difficult, but here's my admittedly simplistic attempt at making sense of what Paul may be getting at here. Well, I propose that maybe it could be that the false teachers were promoting ascetic practices such as fasting as a means or to experiencing angelic worship, however you want to take that phrase, and of having visionary experiences. In other words, the false teachers claimed that their experience of angelic worship and their receiving of divine revelations or visions came about as a result of their ascetic practices such as fasting. And they were going on endlessly talking about their so-called visionary experiences. Now, friends, this could be what was happening back then. Right? We can't be sure. But what's certain, friends, is this. It was all very mystical and experiential. It all appears very spiritual. And it's precisely these claims of revelations and experiences that made the Colossians feel that they were missing out, that they were deficient, that there is something wrong with them. So let's bring it a bit closer to, our, 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 to home, to ourselves. Let's ask ourselves, what about us? Have we ever wondered if there's something more to the Christian life, if you're missing out, if there's something wrong with you in your Christian walk, especially after hearing or reading about the spiritual experiences or exploits of other Christians. For example, you may have Christian friends who constantly claim to see visions, to have angelic visitations, or to have ecstatic experiences in worship. Right? Extraordinary, supernatural, spiritual experiences. 
And here you are, having no such experiences whatsoever and having nothing spectacular to show. Nothing except the ordinary means of grace, nothing but your plain old Bible, ordinary prayer life, and familiar faces in fellowship. And you wonder if there's something more to the Christian life, if there's something that you're missing out on. And you start questioning your, spirit, your spirituality, your faith, and maybe even you start to question God's love for you. Friends, to make matters worse, some pastors even boldly make the claim that if you don't experience supernatural things such as signs, wonders, miracles, and so forth, then you are missing out. Right? You're living but a natural, mundane life, a boring and limited existence. Now, friends, don't get me wrong. All right? I'm in no way denying the supernatural in the Christian life. Right? God is certainly able to do as He pleases. But my point, and I believe Paul's point, is that we should not be seeking or chasing after such experiences and boasting about them. And we are certainly not to be imposing it upon others and judging them on that basis. You know, friends, in a room this size, my guess is that you probably know of Christians or even pastors who claim and boast of such supernatural experiences. Right? They keep on harping about what they have seen, heard, or experienced. And some even write books about them. All right? Just a glance at the shelves of our local Christian bookstores will show that this is common. For example, all right, books such as The Mystical Path to Christ or Working with Angels and so forth, all right, these books are common, these books abound, even at Kurong. And it's precisely at this point, friends, that we need to heed Paul's warning. Right? Let no one condemn, disqualify, or demean you with such things. For friends, the thing is this. These so-called spiritual Christians, right, they tend to be more excited about their visions, encounters, and experiences than they are about Christ. And they tend to elevate you know, their subjective experiences above the objective word. Listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say about such ones. Verse 19. He says, Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the hate from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. Friends, don't you love the Apostle Paul? Right? He doesn't mince his words. And what a stinging indictment this is. Right? Paul says that in spite of what these false teachers were trying to show, namely their spirituality, they are, in Paul's reckoning and in reality, unspiritual. Right? They are inflated or puffed up by the empty notions of their unspiritual or more literally fleshly minds. But more than that, and most critically, Paul says that these ones have lost connection with the head. They're not holding on to Christ. They have been severed from Christ. I mean, these false teachers and their false teaching are not rooted in Christ. And therein lies the problem. For contrary to what the false teachers may be claiming, right, Christian growth does not come about nor is Christian maturity measured by, by our undergoing certain experiences or having certain practices in our lives. No, friends, Christian growth, Paul says, only comes about by our being connected to Christ, by our holding, by our holding fast to Christ, by our abiding in Christ. That's what Paul is getting at here when he says that it is from Christ that the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with a growth from God. As we saw last time in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, it is by virtue of our union with Christ and our continuing to walk in Christ that we grow and are established in the faith. So let's see to it that no one condemns, judges, or disqualifies us, insisting that we have to have certain experiences if we are to be counted as spiritual or if we are to live a powerful, effective Christian life. For such things, friends, they only foster pride. It leads to spiritual elitism, it leads to spiritual one-upmanship, and it leads to the dividing of the church into the haves and the have-nots. So friends, let's beware of the counterfeit spirituality of mysticism. Let's not exchange the genuine for the counterfeit. For the truth is that we have everything that we need in Christ. All right, thirdly and finally, Paul warns us against the counterfeit spirituality of asceticism. Look at verses 20 to 23. Paul writes, 
If you died with Christ to the elements of the world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up, but they are human commands and doctrines. Even though these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Friends, did you notice the regulations in this passage? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Right? All negatives telling us what we are not to do. Well, apparently the false teachers were not only advocating legalism and mysticism, but they were also promoting asceticism as a means of pleasing God, of drawing closer to God, of becoming more spiritual. So, what's asceticism? Well, the pocket dictionary of theological terms defines it as follows. Asceticism is the teaching that spirituality is attained through renunciation of physical pleasures and personal desires while concentrating on spiritual matters. In other words, an ascetic is one who practices rigorous self-denial, even self-affliction in bid to please God or to draw closer to God or to become more spiritual. And, that, and this is what the false teachers were imposing upon the Colossians. Right? They were saying, if you want to be serious in the faith, if you want to please God, if you want to kill the flesh, then you need to live an ascetic life. Right? You need to deny yourself of the pleasures of the world. You need to discipline your body, punish your body, abuse your body. Only then will you attain true spirituality. In offense, this reminds me of a certain Martin Luther. In 1505, Martin Luther he entered the monastery thinking that the best way he can serve God was to abandon his home, family, and the world. And there in the monastery, the young Luther, he picked up right, the ascetic practices of the monks. Luther would go on regular fasts, often going without food and drink for days on end. He would climb the so-called holy stairs on his knees, repeating the Lord's Prayer and kissing each step along the way doing so until his knees grew calloused. And in fact, Luther was once found missing from the services, only to be found lying unconscious on the floor of his cell. Apparently, his severe treatment of his body had taken its toll. But Luther, he would keep up the ascetic practices in his bid to draw closer to God and to find peace with God. In fact, listen to Luther's own words as to what he did and why he did what he did. He writes, I tortured myself with prayer, fasting, uh, vigils, and freezing. But the frost alone might have killed me. And he says this, What else did I seek by doing this but God, who was supposed to note my strict observance of the monastic order and my austere life? And elsewhere, Luther writes, When I was a monk, I worried myself greatly for almost 15 years with the daily sacrifice, tortured myself with fastings, vigils, prayers, and, er and, and other very rigorous works. I earnestly thought to acquire righteousness by my works. And friends, in what is perhaps one of my favorite Luther's quotes is this. Luther says, I was a good monk, and I kept the rules of my order so strictly that I may say, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, I love the word, it was I. My friends, such is the ascetic lifestyle of young Luther in his beat, or should I say his misdirected beat, to find peace with God. And friends, that, it seems, is what the false teachers are trying to impose upon the Colossians, maybe as a means to attain a higher spiritual life or to grow in holiness. But notice Paul's response to this ascetic approach to the Christian life. Firstly, he reminds them of, the reality, of their reality of their having died with Christ and its implications for believers. Verses 20 to 21. He says, If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Well, Paul is reminding us here that believers are dead to all these man-made, and as we saw last time, demonically inspired Rules, right? Rules that go beyond what is revealed in Scripture. Friends, as Christians, by virtue of union with Christ, we have died to these rules. We have been raised with Christ 
and we have been transferred into his kingdom. And therefore, friends, our lives are to be governed not by the rules of men, but by Christ and Christ alone. We have been set free from the rules of men by the death of Christ. And then Paul, he goes on to point out for us the futility of such ascetic rules in verses 22 to 23. Paul writes, all these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. Right? There are human commands and doctrines. All of these have a reputation of, for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body. They are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Do you see what Paul is doing here? Right? Paul exposes the futility of such rules by reminding us that they are but human commands and doctrines. They are based on human traditions. They are man-made. In other words, these rules have their source not in divine revelation, but in human speculation. And as such, they only deal with things temporal, not things eternal. Right? Things that have no lasting value. Things that, as Paul puts it, are destined to perish with use. But friends, as if this is not enough, Paul hammers the final nail into the ascetic's coffin. He says that such rules only appear wise, pious, and holy. But in actual fact, it is of no value. It accomplishes nothing. And the reason is this. Right? These rules only focus on the external, not the internal. On the actions, not the heart. And therefore, it is futile in curbing the desires of the flesh. It is useless in our fight against temptation. It is impotent in our battle against sin. I like how commentator Harry Ironside puts it. He says, One may shut himself up in a monastery in order to escape the world, only to find that he has taken the world in with him. How true, friends. Such ascetic lifestyle accomplishes nothing whatsoever, for it does nothing to the heart of man. So let's see to it that we do not buy into or be enslaved by these man-made rules. Right? Don't think that simply by observing these rules, we are holy. And don't let anyone tell us that these rules will help us draw closer to God. For friends, the truth is that we are complete and we have all that we need in Christ. Let's not exchange the genuine for the counterfeit. Well, friends, we mentioned at the start of the sermon that Satan, he is the master counterfeiter. Right? He seeks to deceive and lead us astray not by means of obvious and blatant heresies, but by subtle and insidious lies, by presenting us with a counterfeit version of the truth, with a subtly different form of Christianity. And Paul, he's keenly aware of that. And he does not want us here to be ignorant of Satan's schemes. And in our passage today, Paul has unmasked three counterfeit spiritualities that seem so true, so right, so Christian, but are not. In fact, they are like a drop of poison in a glass of water. Right? It's dangerous and it can kill. But friends, what I want to point out, point out tonight is this. What we've seen today is only a glimpse, a sample, a, just a snippet of the various forms that Satan's counterfeits can take. All right? we could, he could use many other ways to try to deceive us from our sure standing in Christ. So friends, a good question to ask ourselves is this. Have we bought into any lies? Or do we have any practices that suggest, no matter how subtly, that Christ is not enough, that Christ is not sufficient, that Christ can't satisfy? Or maybe we can ask ourselves, in what ways have we imbibed the norms and philosophies of our culture and baptized or incorporated it into our Christian life or church life? Friends, we need to be discerning. And we do well to be careful that we not be taken captive by the insinuating and enticing lies of the enemy, that there are add-ons to the faith that will boost our spiritual life or take us to the next level if we were but to undergo certain rituals or practices. For friends, the truth that we need to remember is this. In Christ, we have fullness. Right? In Christ, we are complete. In Christ, we have everything we need for life and godliness. Like why we this morning, 
the gospel and Christ is sufficient. He is enough. Therefore, let us hold on to Christ. Let us remain in Christ. And let us continue walking in Him. Let's not trade the genuine for the counterfeit. For Christ and Christ alone is the solid rock on which we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you a lot, God, even for your word, which is ever true, ever relevant. Even if you have heard from um, Paul's warning tonight, O oh God, of Satan's counterfeits, O oh God, I pray and ask, God, help us as individuals and as a church, O oh God, to grow in this spiritual discernment, O oh God, and help us always to fall back upon your word, to test all things by your word, O oh God. Father, help us not to be gullible or naive Christians in these last days, but help us to be on guard always, O oh God, and to watch out for one another, lest we be tempted and fall away from you, O oh God. So Lord, I pray and ask, O oh God, just drill this deep down within us, teach us your word, and establish us firmly upon your truth, and help us to know that Christ and Christ alone, O oh God, is sufficient, and he is the solid rock on which we stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.